our live audience as well to ODS's keynote event with Carrie Vandenberg. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping things. At this time, I would kindly ask each of you to silence your cell phones. We would also like each of you to be aware that we have interpreters and cart services available. Live captioning will also be on the screen. If at any point you need to use the restrooms, they are located in the hall directly outside of this room. In case of an emergency, please be aware that the emergency exits are located in the back of this room. My name is Mary Abba Pearson. I'm a senior here at JNU in the social work program, and this semester I, so, I serve as the ODS social work intern. It's truly amazing to be in a space with such a great mixture of allies, students, faculty, staff, and members of the Harrisonburg community. I am thrilled that all of you decided to be a part of this year's Disability Awareness Week festivities. As a student, Disability Awareness Week is extremely important to JMU students because it gives us an opportunity to acknowledge that disability is an essential part of diversity. I think that as students increase their awareness of different disabilities, it gives students an opportunity to create a more equitable and inclusive campus for all by using universal design. It is my pleasure to now introduce Katherine Rathgerber, who is an assistant director for JMU's Office of Disability Services. Catherine has served as a vital member of the ODS team for nearly six years. She has a diverse background in social work, education, and advocacy. Hello, I'm Catherine Rathgeber. As Mary Abbott shared, I'm one of the assistant directors of the Office of Disability Services. In my position, I've had the privilege of working with my amazing ODS colleagues, campus partners, and community collaborators to plan and implement disability awareness programming. As we all know, life is often unpredictable, and as a result of the pandemic, our week of disability awareness and disability acceptance events in March have been put on hold for the last two years. While our week's events may have been on hold, our work to provide services and programming to support the creation and maintenance of inclusive, equitable environments continued. While our March events may have been on hold, our allies, including individuals with disabilities themselves, have continued to push for equity, inclusion, and greater acceptance on campus and in the greater community. We work towards our goal every day, every week, every year. We hope that your participation in Disability Awareness Week 2022 sparks allyship within you so that we can work together toward a better, more inclusive, accessible, and just tomorrow. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Associate Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, our friend, our ally, Dr. Brent Lewis. Good evening. As Catherine said, I'm Brent Lewis, Associate Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and it is my pleasure to be speaking with you all this evening. As the AVP for DEI, I get to engage, learn, support, and advocate on behalf of ODS and our students with disabilities. Disability awareness programming is important to the JMU community because it does just what the title says. It provides awareness, knowledge, and skills to put in our toolkit, but most of all, it challenges us. In the world of DEI, disabilities can sometimes be an area that does not get a lot of focus as we consider inclusive education and experiences. Disability Awareness Week and the programming it provides gives us a friendly reminder to consider accessibility for all and the use of universal design. It is my honor to introduce to you the keynote speaker for this evening, Ms. Carrie Vandenberg, who I had the awesome opportunity to meet earlier today. Carrie is a 2020 JD graduate of American University, Washington College of Law. She dedicated her law school career to learning about human rights issues facing people with disabilities worldwide. 
During her time as a student attorney in her law school's disability rights law clinic, Carrie advanced the interests of people with disabilities in special education, Medicaid, and other proceedings. She also interned with Disability Rights International, where she researched international standards on inclusive education and community integration, drafted a amicus curiae brief for the European Court of Human Rights, and attended a session of the Conference of State Parties for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Carrie now works as an attorney for Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities in Washington, D.C., protecting and promoting the decision-making rights of people with disabilities. She chose to become an attorney because as a woman with a disability, she is aware of the current human rights violations people with disabilities are facing worldwide. It is with great passion that she aspires to play a part in the creating meaningful social change for the disability community. Please welcome to JMU, or back to JMU, Carrie Vandenberg. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, I just want to extend a special thank you to my dear mentor, Valerie Schoolcraft, for inviting me here and back to JMU tonight. Um, this is a full circle moment for me. Um, I've mentioned to quite a few people today that it has been seven years since I stepped foot on JMU's campus. Um, and while I worked here, or while I was going to school here, I worked as a peer access advocate for the Office of Disability Services. So I planned Disability Awareness Week and I gave introductory statements for our keynote speakers. So this is a very wild moment for me. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be standing here tonight talking about the thing that I care most about, which is disability rights. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my story, um, what brought me to do this work, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we can create more inclusive communities for everyone. Um, and then at the end, I want to reserve a little time for a Q&A, because I would also love to hear from all of you. So when I was planning this event, Valerie and I were talking, and she asked me, why now? You know, why having these conversations now is so important? And of course, the first thought I had, as I think so many of us do right now, is the pandemic. Um, COVID really just brought forth the issues that the disability community has faced uh, for far too long, which is being shoved into corners and sort of forgotten about. Um, in DC alone, so people with developmental disabilities were eight times more likely to contract COVID and five times more likely to die from it. Um, and, you know, we were left out of the conversations uh, that were being had about masks mandates and vaccine mandates, and these were really dire conversations for the disability community. And again, these aren't new issues. These people with disabilities have been, been being left out of these conversations for, for forever. Um, and so that's why having these conversations is, is so important. And more generally speaking, disability affects all of us, um, you know, aren't we, those of us who don't have disabilities, just temporarily abled, um, with illness and injury, sickness, uh, mental health challenges, aging, we are all bound to experience disability, if not ourselves, the people we love or people close to us. So these, these conversations matter for all of us. Uh, disability rights are really about all of us. And I learned that at the age of 12. Um, so when I was 12 years old, I was hit in the eye with a pinata stick during a pinata game. Um, almost laughable, and, and at times I've made many jokes about it. Um, although, that's my family laughing because they also make jokes about it. Um, disability can be funny. Um, so, uh, freak accident, I was standing about 20 feet away from a pinata um, watching a game and a little boy swung at the pinata and the stick flew out of his hands and hit me directly in my left eye. And my life changed instantly. So the next few years were 
filled with excruciating surgeries. Um, I wasn't able to go to school. I was addicted to pain medication and went through withdrawal at the age of 13 years old um, and eventually had to make the very painful decision to have my eye removed completely. And I'm very grateful that I had wise and kind parents who knew that I had to be the person to make that decision, that I had to live with the consequences of that decision. Um, and so I made that, made that choice. And I now live with a prosthetic eye, and I am half blind. Um, and my experience with accepting my disability was not easy. Um, I still remember the first time I heard my mom combine my name and the word disabled in the same sentence, and I rejected it. You know, I am not disabled. Um, I remember saying to her so defiantly because I had already been subjected to the social conditioning that we all had, that being disabled meant that I was less, less entitled to basic rights, less worthy, less desirable. And I didn't want, I didn't want to accept that reality. Um, but fortunately, in a weird way, um, I was forced to. I was forced to become a self-advocate because I was not afforded a fair and equitable education. Um, I am visually impaired and I am a visual learner. And so the types of accommodations that were offered to me were things like books on tape. So all of my learning materials were only offered to me solely in audio format. Didn't work for me. I don't remember ever using a single one. Um, and so I had to learn to sort of adapt on my own. I, I remember using magnifying glasses. Um, and so the way my disability presents itself is that I have fairly good vision in my right eye. However, when I read any type of font for a long period of time, um, I get really horrible eye strain, um, terrible headaches. So I have this lovely memory of my fourth day of law school. Um, I lived close enough to my campus where I could walk home, and I was walking home from school that day with my eyes closed because I couldn't see anymore. I'm sure you all know law school is a lot of reading. And institutions like that do not especially cater to uh, the disabled. Academia trumps disabilities by far. Um, so in high school, I experienced that right there at the beginning. Um, I remember as well taking the SATs. I told this story earlier at the panel. And the only accommodation I received at that point, they had caught on big fonts was what I needed. So they gave me packets that were this big. And I had to use two, pa two hands to turn each page. And that was not, that was not accessible. Uh, so I left high school having learned the value of self-advocacy, but further recognizing that my voice was not meant to be reserved just for myself. And if used wisely and kindly, my voice was the most powerful tool that I had. So I came to JMU thinking I wanted to do special education, that I wanted to be a part of that, that system. But what I quickly realized was that being a part of the system wouldn't allow me to actually create the kind of change that I wanted to see happen. That was the first time I thought law school. And honestly, it was the most terrifying thought I have ever had uh, in my life because it was bigger than the narratives I had told myself that I was. And it was bigger than the capabilities I told myself I had. So I, you know, from there, it was, it was kind of a maybe. Uh, and I decided to choose a major that would set a foundation for my career. And that's when I chose social work. So I am very lucky that I got to be a social work student here at JMU and learn the values of compassion and integrity and activism that really set that foundation for, for my career as a lawyer. It gave me a very unique perspective, and I am grateful for that. It also just enhanced my advocacy skills because I was the only person that was a disability rights advocate in my major at the time. And I often found myself in situations where I was challenged to speak up and to educate. And I found myself having to take those opportunities over and over again, and they were so valuable. 
Um, my other great learning opportunity, as I've already mentioned, I was a peer access advocate at the Office of Disability Services here. And through that role, I learned just phenomenal, phenomenal lessons. Door after door after door was opened for me um, through that experience. And what I was able to recognize through my role as a peer access advocate is I was able to ex witness the inequities that other people were experiencing in this community, in the disability community. And I learned that it wasn't enough to merely sympathize with the injustices that I was witnessing. That it was my responsibility to determine how I could best take action um, based on what my unique skill set was. And at that point, I knew I was an advocate. And that was the forcing function of, okay, I have to go to law school. You know, I have to do the thing that feels absolutely terrifying because maybe I can do more, uh, become more of who I am capable of being if I do this horrifying thing. Um, so, I, so I did it. So that is really, you know, my, my educational story. But what I think that the question that remains for all of us is, in each of our roles in life, the question is, how can I take action to fight for equity, um, to embody inclusivity for people with disabilities? And I think that's an, an important question because people with disabilities live in a world that is not designed for them. And yet people with disabilities can do anything they want to. And the key word here is want to, but people, with the only way we can do that as disabled people is if we are given environments in which we can thrive. And I think the answer to that is universal design. So universal design, for those of you who don't know, is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed and used and understood by the greatest audience possible. So this isn't a special requirement. Um, this is not just something that benefits disabled people. It is something that is useful for everyone. Um, essentially, you know, people say it's good design. It's functional. So the greatest example is these are things that we interact with in our everyday lives and we don't even realize it. So it's something like a curb cut, which is obviously very useful for someone who uses a mobility device, like a wheelchair, but also very useful for a mom pushing a stroller or someone using a dolly or um, anything you could possibly think of. I used a ramp today because I'm wearing heels and my feet hurt. Um, so these, these are things that we interact with every single day um, that make our, again, our environments just more, more useful, more functional. Um, and so taking that a step further is something called universal design for learning. And the reason why I think this idea is so important is because, as I stated, my, my whole story of advocacy started with education. And I genuinely believe that our education system is the key to creating meaningful social change. So imagine if we started implementing universal design for learning into our classrooms and people began to engage with inclusive, accessible environments earlier on, those same people would go out into the world, into their communities, into their careers, uh, carrying that understanding of accessibility and perhaps more willing to take action to ensure that accessibility is the standard. So a normalization of accessibility could, could occur. It wouldn't just be impacting positively those present day students, but we could actually be creating a better future. Um, but implementing universal design for learning requires administrators and teachers to think beyond what they must be doing legally and what they should be doing to make learning accessible to the broadest possible audience. So an example I have of this is when I was in law school, I had a professor who was absolutely terrifying to me, just a stereotypical professor, and law school professor at that. Um, and he gave a take home exam that was not graded, was really low key, and he was uh, 
we were using Scantrons to submit our answers. I don't use Scantrons because tracking is really difficult. I mess them up. It's just not worth it. Um, and I thought, well, this is an easy conversation to have. So I went down after class and spoke with him. And I think I got maybe a sentence out. You know, I said, I'm, I'm visually impaired and I don't. And he cut me off and he, he stated, you can't tell me that. I'm not allowed to know. And you know, at this point, I am a fierce self-advocate. I am there studying to be a disability rights advocate. And I immediately felt that familiar sense of shame and guilt. Like, oh, I've done something wrong. I've, I've disclosed and, and I've now, you know, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, I left angry. That shame dis dissipated pretty quickly. And, and also recognizing that he thought he was doing his job, that his students with disabilities were meant to remain anonymous. Grading was anonymous in law school. He was doing his part. But I think it points to the bigger picture here of what we should be doing for a lot of us is on the very basic level of removing these attitudinal barriers firsthand. I mean, if I was using a wheelchair or I didn't have my prosthetic eye in that day, my disclosure would be written on my face. Um, and so he had this, you know, this, again, societal conditioning in his mind of what disability is. And um, if administrators and faculty and teachers could start creating environments that were beyond what are the accommodation lists that they're receiving as checkbox, right? So we receive those accommodation lists. They, they think they're doing what they must be doing and they're good to go. But what if we opened that up further? What if we took it a step further to, okay, but how do all of my students learn? How can I ensure that my materials are accessible to each of those types of learners, right? So it's really, um, it's, it's, I, excuse me for a second. I think that it is about creating equitable learning environments versus equal learning environments. And equal and learning environments, I think, are what we achieve by using accommodations, whereas equity is what we would achieve by using universal design. And this is hard, you know? It, it is hard to create class, classrooms like this in a world like this because it's a different way of teaching and thinking and therefore it's uncomfortable. And I'm not here to say otherwise. Um, but what I am here to say is that it's okay that we make mistakes, that we have to make mistakes in order to do something differently. We're human. Um, and it's even necessary because what we're doing right now is not working and it hasn't been working for too long. We know it isn't working because we live in a largely segregated world, the abled and the disabled. And a segregated world is not a world I think any of us want to live in because it's limiting our ability to achieve our highest potential as humans. It's, it's limiting our ability to be fully human. Think about it, how uncomfortable it may feel for some of us to interact with someone that doesn't use words to communicate. We immediately assume that we cannot possibly connect to that individual and it's easier to push them into a corner and pretend like they don't exist. But that bridge to that connection already exists because we are simply human. Um, we have to be willing to be bravely vulnerable enough to want to include people with disabilities in our society. So how can any of us be okay with existing in a world that pushes some of us into corners because it's easier than trying something new? Creating inclusive environments and using universal design begs us to be bravely vulnerable and human. So I often get asked if I regret the decision to remove my eye, or if I could go back in time and wave a magic wand, would I somehow avoid my accident from ever happening? And my answer is always no, uh, because you know I won't ever downplay the challenges I experienced. Um, they weren't little and they weren't small. Uh, they were very meaningful. And I'm grateful for them, because not only did they give me this fiery passion for this work that I do, for disability rights, but it also gave me the gift of learning that useful skill of brave vulnerability and, and humanness, um, which I think we are all fully capable of. And so my life has meaning 
because of my accident and my disability story. And I aspire to fill my life with a love for humanity and an appreciation for diversity. And that love inspires me to continue to fight for equity by way of universal design, to fight for a world that embodies belonging, to fight for a fully integrated world. So what I challenge you all to leave here thinking about is that disability is so much more than an identity. It is a way of being. So my question for all of you is how do you want to show up in the world? And what does that world look like? I think here's what we do. We make the choice every single day to exemplify the inclusion of all people. Thank you. And I believe now we have time for some questions, thoughts, feedback. I would absolutely love to hear from all of you. Valerie is going to come around with a microphone. Absolutely. I appreciate you have a question now. Um, so I'm going to repeat questions for our uh, captioning services on our online stream. So he, the question was, the, the trick is that I have to remember the question. Um, the question was, do I find that people who have physical disabilities, if they get treated differently than people with emotional and mental disabilities? Correct? Okay, great. I might paraphrase. Um, so. Yes, of course. Um, I think that people experience disability differently even when they have the same disability. Um, however, I think there are just different stigmas attached, right? There's always assumptions about what we can and can't do, um, about what our experience is, how we got our disabilities, um, all of those types of things. I think that there are really horrible social stigmas around mental health. Generally, we all know that. I think that a lot of people don't even realize that mental health is a disability. Um, it's, they don't even understand that it's included in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, those same rights are, are enforced for people with those disabilities. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think that I would say one of the biggest differences and one of the biggest challenges is we all need to work harder to include mental health disabilities and disability conversation and to make space for it. I did not. I am, I, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, how the story ended with my, my law school professor, if I spoke with him afterwards. And um, I did not speak with him afterwards. I, I will admit, um, I'm not proud of that. Again, I had really solidified my identity as an advocate at that point. However, I was also in my first year of law school, and there was a lot of mental and emotional strife going on, and that professor in particular was causing a lot of that <laughs> mental and emotional strife. So I made, I made the personal decision to, to let that one slide um, for my own personal health, I would say. I had other experiences, though in law school that required, I, I stood up like um, my, a, a different professor, I think this was my second day of law school, um, was giving a hypothetical about a medical student that was kicked in the face by a horse and lost an eye. And then she had my entire class close one eye and said, now imagine being a law student with one eye. <laughs> 
And in that moment, I looked up at the universe and asked, is this a sign that I am not supposed to fear? Should I have listened to that fear, perhaps? Um, but yes, we had a very, very fun conversation afterwards in which she was extremely mortified and very sorry. So. <laughs> So I know that um, the healthcare as well community can be very exclusive. What is something or a message that you would give to healthcare workers about being more inclusive? The question, I believe, was the healthcare world can be very exclusive, as we said, and what are some suggestions or advice for how the healthcare workers can be more inclusive? Got it, cool. Okay, so I, I find, especially during COVID, COVID has just brought up so many nuanced issues, but also highlighted, you know, some of these issues, like that issue, for example, that is persistent and has been around. Um, I think patient advocacy is so important. Um, I think ensuring that you have the ability to see if you can seek out that patient autonomy of any person with a disability, right? Um, see if they have decision-making supports in place. Um, if they don't, if they have supporters that would be willing to help you find out what that person wants. Um, and just, I think the goal is to always treat the person uh, as a person first, beyond a diagnosis, beyond a condition, if you want to call it that, um, and see them as a person always first, a person who has the same rights to make mistakes or take risks in their health care. Um, and yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. So in recent years, um, as education has shifted to different experiences for students like virtual learning and that sort of thing, um, what would you suggest to students who are finding that the differences in learning are not matching their needs and what they would need for accommodations um, as education is changing rapidly? Okay. Here we go. So you're asking, <laughs> in recent years, um, you're saying because of the pandemic, remote learning has shifted how students are experiencing learning. Advice for how, what was that? Advice for advocacy. Advice for advocacy yeah. in terms of remote. Got it, I think. Okay, um, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna maybe go on a tangent and I hope it's going to answer your question. Um, I, we were having a panel discussion earlier on universal design and activism and uh, we were talking a bit about the educational experience and um, I was talking about how I think the the pandemic opened a lot of doors for more accessibility in terms of remote learning um, and things like that for some people. Um, however, I know, for example, in the public school systems, it has created a uh, just a horrendous atmosphere for students with disabilities not receiving accommodations um, in appropriate ways of following their IEPs, their individualized education programs, the 504 plans. Um, so it's really hard. Um, I think from a higher education perspective, we need to be advocating for the continuation of these remote and mixed remote learning uh, experiences that have been really transformative, I think, for a lot of our communities, um, as well as how to creative, creatively implement the accommodations that, that students still need. Um, I think from a lower education standpoint, <laughs> there needs to be, a, I say this as a lawyer, but a lot of legal pushback and a lot of advocacy um, to fulfill their, their legal ob obligations under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, because it's just sort of slipping through the holes at this point. Is that, was that a tangent? Okay, great. So I have two questions from the live chat from YouTube. Oh, fine. The first one is, do you have any practical in-classroom advice for universal design? Yeah, so 
I think, I think a good example, I almost want Jamie to come up here. Um, I think one of the good, a good example is uh, closed captioning. So that's something that's easy to do is finding videos that already have closed captioning embedded in them um, and to use those. That, so I'm someone that loves subtitles. I'm, again, visual learner. I don't watch anything without subtitles. I feel like I can't hear if I'm not reading. Um, and so, you know, that's something that's just very useful for visual learners, for people that might uh, be deaf or have hearing loss in your classroom. So something like that would be really practical and easy to accomplish. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that one for now. Absolutely. Um, I have experienced a lot of interesting things as a woman, especially in the, the legal profession, as a disabled woman in the legal profession. Um, it is an uphill battle every day, I would say. I, I have said this too many times that I can count that I feel like I have to work five times as hard to be taken seriously. Um, I have had people insinuate that inter internships that I, I got during law school were because of the way that I looked. Um, and these were all disability related internships. Um, so those, those things are challenging, but honestly, they're just things to notice and set aside because I love what I do and I work really hard to do what I do. And I think, you know, that speaks for itself. Thank you so much for your talk. It was so good. I'm hoping to take another one, okay? <laughs> you are fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I had a few thoughts, you know, while, while you were sharing, and thank you for sharing. Um, I, when I say the world, we live in a world that was not designed for us. Um, the thing I think of when when having that thought is the social model of disability, which is something that highlights the fact that our societies, our communities, our spaces are not designed for people with disabilities. So those barriers that are just present in our everyday life are what are actually making us disabled. And if we were to remove those barriers, we'd almost be removing disability itself. Um, the other thing that I thought of is, you know, I always, always think about disability um, and the parallel between Brown versus Board of Education. And that is the world that disabled people live in, is a, is a fully segregated world. We have fully segregated school systems. Um, and we are fighting a battle that is 
been prevalent for so long. Um, and it does cross so many different intersections, right? Disability, like I said, it affects all of us. It doesn't care what, what race you are, uh, where you come from, what religion you have. This is about all of us, and yet no one is having these conversations. Um, and it often feels like an uphill battle, you know? I sometimes feel like I'm doing this work that I know so many of us here feel this way that, that almost no one cares about. Um, but I think that's just all the more encouraging um, to do it. Little impacts, they matter, and they, I think they bring me a lot of hope. Um, so we'll just keep having these conversations and, and taking action um, like I was speaking about. Yeah, thank you. That is a wonderful question. I forgot that I haven't been repeating questions. <laughs> so again, doing really good at this. Christina, in summary, her question was, if I see there being a place in the law for universal design, um, and that is actually something, strangely, I have never thought about. Um, but yes, I do. I definitely do. I could, you know, the ADA is this beautiful document that we worked so hard. I say we. my wonderful predecessor, so Judith Heumann, gotta give her a wonderful shout out. Um, if you don't know who Judith Heumann is, look her up. But uh, she really led the way for um, all of the disability legislation that we currently have in place. And the Americans with Disabilities Act is somewhat new, um, but and it has given us so much, but there's so much about it that could be fixed or revamped or added to, right? So I, I think that that's a beautiful concept. How can we, sort of legislate universal design in a way that would make it more impactful. Um, that's great. I think so. I'm an idealist, though. Um, <laughs> been told that more times than I can count in my life. Um, but maybe. He's loud. <laughs> Uh huh. Thank you, Bill. Oh, great. Hi, everyone online. <laughs> Are we concluding? I think so. Let's do well, thank you, everyone. I, I just truly, truly appreciate you having me back here to JMU tonight. It has been my biggest honor and privilege to, to share what I care about most um, with where it all began. So it has been lovely. steps to include people through universal design and accommodation. And to my many, 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 many campus partners, I want to send you a shout out 
Um, you support this work. You make these events possible. And um, I'm not naming too many names because there's a lot of them, and I leave someone out inadvertently. Um, but you touch my heart. I want to send a shout out of appreciation to our interpreters, Judy Bradley and Lisa Spurgeon, and to our yeah. They're, they're a routine part of my life, and so um, they're just a joy to work with. And as you're captioning online, many thanks to them, and Bob Davis and Steve, all the festival crew that put us together tonight. Thank you. And the JMU content production team, thank you, thank you, thank you. I need to send out a, a great deal of gratitude to faculty members who work with us every day. We send out thousands upon thousands of access plan letters and those that are received well and they're implemented you know we, we can do our work inside the office but if faculty members aren't our partners it's all for naught and um, this week a couple of faculty members opened up their classrooms Cindy Hunter and Danielle Price allowed us to be there and engage with students in ways that we would have challenges doing with you know we, we couldn't do that without them and um, my Office of Disability Services team, a lot of them are here tonight, some of them are online. Um, I just want to thank them for the work they put in every day um, and for the incredible passion with, with which they deliver the services to students and support to faculty. They make my life a lot easier by how fabulous they do that. Yes. Um, yeah, they, they just, my job's not possible without them. The other place I have to extend gratitude is Dr. Brent Lewis. He's, he interviewed during a pandemic, came to this place. Henry, <laughs> he didn't see the campus till after he accepted the job. Um, <laughs> But if, if you don't know him well yet, I, I let him know the thing, one of the things he's great at, he's great at multiple things, but one of them is that he remembers people super well. That's been true from day one. But he's also fabulous at lending us support, a listening ear for me, and for being a champion for positive change on campus. And he, he remembers student stories. And so um, he too is a backbone for this work on campus, and I'm really grateful. Dr. Miller can't be with us tonight because he's up at NASPA learning and connecting and all those good things. But for him, in terms of his ability and, and advocacy for resources and policy change and attention to student needs, both individually and collectively, I'm grateful. Um, he, he never hesitates to send things my way so that Brent and I can address it. Carrie. <laughs> All right, so those of you who don't know, we, I, I, I tell this all the time. I joke with Carrie, she spent as much time with me as with many of her faculty members. It was quite the privilege to have her in the Office of Disability Services during her undergraduate years. She fueled passion amongst all of us. And, um, you know, the joy in this work in disability services and student affairs is to see students pursue their dreams, right? Um, when, when one walks alongside us and helps um, build us back as well, that's just a privilege. Your willingness to come and speak with us is so affirming and such a positive reminder of the reasons for supporting students along the way in their education. Um, we appreciate you. We appreciate the work you're doing to create a safer, more inclusive world for people. And we thank you for being with us and providing such encouragement for continuing in our development as advocates and activists. So um, with that, I just want to thank you uh, for making this stop back home. Many thanks to all of you for coming out. I'll be around a few minutes if you have questions about ODS, but um, we're all for universal design and accommodations when that hasn't met the need. Have a great night.